And now with great pleasure, I'd like you to introduce you to our guest speaker, who is Angel. Angel prefers the pronouns they and them, uh, is a queer sex educator and sex coach. Uh, they love discussions around consent, sexual health, and sexuality. Angel is currently wrapping up a master's degree in counseling psychology. And the organization, Aspect, is a sex-positive non-profit organization that was founded by sex-positive individuals with the goal of providing a safer space to support the public by offering shame-free sex education resources uh, with a focus on consent, sexual empowerment, and sexual diversity. We operate out of, or they operate, sorry, out of pop-up locations across the province as well as online. And so thank you so much for being with us today, Angel. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for such a lovely um, introduction. That's better than I would have done for myself. Uh, today, our topic is pronouns. And obviously, as I use um, non-binary pronouns, that's a very important topic to me. But before we launch into it, I would really like to know from folks what your understanding of pronouns, the way they're being used today is, what kind of questions you have, and what you're hoping to gain from the presentation today. And that'll help guide me as to where we take the conversation in the presentation. I noticed that, that and my question is specifically because I noticed that you use uh, two words that I would consider plural. And I'm just wondering um, uh, why that is as opposed to the, some pronoun that might be not plural and a, a plural. So that's my Perfect. question. Awesome. Anyone else? Uh, Angel, uh, Larry, I sometimes get confused by the sort of the new words created and uh, perhaps a bit of an explanation of that would help me at least. Thanks. Hi, Angel. Um, it's Jan. I would be interested in hearing what you had to say about dating for seniors, some of the um, tips you could give us, um, you know, especially when a person is protective of their assets and unwilling to open, um, you know, how to, how to be safe. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just want to go for it. Dating seniors. Awesome. I see Ace has his hand up there. Okay, I'm Ace, the person formerly known as Grace. I'm a transgender man. Although I present binary, I do not feel that I'm binary. I feel female on the inside and male on the outside. Whereas I lived as a lesbian, I was female on the outside and male on the inside. So I understand the, the uh, non-binary. Uh, when I try to remember the word they and them, it has annoyed me for a long time because I know it as a plural. I think of my friends who are Indigenous who are two-spirited and realize there's a male and female spirit within them and that's why their uh, gender expression is non-binary. Although I do identify as non-binary, emotionally I do look binary physically. So I do still go by he, him because if I get into the conversation with non-binary people, they get angry because my presentation doesn't match the concept of non-binary. So I don't go into the they, them. I, I thought it would be better if they, if they had the word Z or Zim or like the, some of the thing that uh, Kate Bernstein kind of, is it Bernstein? Recommended her, her concept of non-binary words would have been better, I think than if they pick the word they and them because it's so plural in our language. Although we have learned, used it singly, like they cut me off. It could be one person in the car and you say they cut me off. So I get it, but anyhow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Ace. Anybody else have anything to add? And you can interrupt me at any time too. I know typically they say to keep your questions to the end. But I think it's important when we're talking about something that's so subjective and yet so prevalent in society right now that we can address concerns and stuff as they come up. Um, so if nobody else has anything to add at the moment, I'll kind of like launch in. Go ahead. 
Can I just add one thing? I, the uh, Ace brought up the Z Zim possibility, and a few years ago, I was helping um, an agency with their outcomes management software, and we we're trying to pick pronouns. So I did a, a research on, and I was amazed at the the number of non-binary terms that were available and uh limitation of that database we had we had limited possibilities to insert pronouns and i finally asked why is it important to have pronouns at all in the in a statistical database so that was one of my concerns about if you could possibly talk about where pronoun use where you see it going in the next little while good question I'm making little stickies so that I can go through things and make sure I've addressed everybody's questions. Um, so I, if with your permission, I would just like to give you a little bit of backstory about myself, my gender and my pronouns. Um, so I turned 50 this year. I didn't figure out I wasn't straight until I was 40. I actually thought I was having hot flashes, but it turned out I was just attracted to her. And it wasn't until I had some really in-depth conversations at the ASPEC Center that I began to understand that a lot of people who are assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth are really comfortable with the gender that comes with that. And I honestly, until five years ago, thought that all people who were born with a uterus felt the same way about femininity and being female that I felt. That it was a bunch of garbage and that nobody should have that box and that it's a patriarchal thing that was handed down to us and we're just kind of stuck having to fight people and all those expectations i honestly believed that every single person assigned female at birth felt the same way as me and it was in meeting a trans woman when i was talking about how gender is a construct which it is right? It's all those traits and personality things and even activities that we assign to people based on their genitals. And science isn't behind that, right? Having a uterus does not make us more nurturing, right? It doesn't make us um, less able to do calculations. And having a penis doesn't mean that we're better at solving problems and less able to have emotions, right? Like that's not how biology works. And she said to me, that's all great that you feel that way about your gender. And I agree it's a construct, but I worked my butt off, she said to me, to take all that femininity that I know is part of who I am and live the life as a woman in that, that way that you're saying is garbage. It's very, it's very rude right? It's very discompassionate. It's, it's, you need to expand your view. And um, she knows now, but back then she didn't realize like she created an identity crisis for me and sharing that information. And I had to do a lot of looking inward. Ace has something. Go ahead. I, I'm married to a transgender woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I asked her what type of woman she aspired to be, uh, she says she wants to be extremely feminine. And the feminist in me went, ding, ding, no, no, don't pick that, right? Um, just because I know about toxic femininity, which isn't really discussed. A lot of toxic masculinity is discussed. But I had been psychologically abused by my ex-lesbian wife for 18 years. But anyhow, that's another story. But so I was really upset about that. And she says, you were denied your masculinity. I was denied my femininity. We were pushed to the extreme, me to a debutante and a model, and her off to be macho man. So we needed that kind of thing. But there's always criticism about that from people who were gender queer and non-binary. Like, why did you pick these awful stereotypical roles? Because we wanted to. My choice, my body. And your experience, absolutely. And I think that's really important when we're looking at pronouns, whether you're talking to me or somebody who uses Fay Fem or Zezer or, or any of these new, they're called neo pronouns because they're, they're new, um, whereas they, them is not new. But uh, 
it's important that we recognize that what we need to do is validate the person where they're at in their own journey and respect that that's what's true for them and that that truth is going to flex and change as our experiences change both past experiences and what we're living in right now and that's okay it doesn't make it any less valid and for me like that was the learning cusp was to recognize that cis women don't spend every day discounting anything that has to do with gender and that means i'm not cis so like if you can imagine here i created the safe space for people who are non-binary and transgender and stuff thinking i was the cis person being an ally and going oh like now i have to do this work so for me that's where non-binary fits for me it's more like gender anarchy right i don't like gender i don't like anything about it i don't i don't feel it in my own experiences but that doesn't mean that i can't respect that you do and i think that's what we're seeing in the queer community is a lot of people going well this is my experience so everybody has to have this perspective yeah. so to your perspective and i understand that's a process that we have to go through in learning about ourselves. um but i hope that by the end of this at least we've all made a little bit of room for people whose experiences are outside of our norms even when we had to fight to figure out what our norm is so like that's kind of like my experience and where i'm sitting in and why i think this is such an important conversation to have in the queer community um so let's see let's start with plural and single for they them so i like that ace already brought this to the table where we do use they in the plural all the time if i walk up to a bus stop and i see somebody's left a backpack there i go oh someone left the backpack here i wonder if they're gonna come back for it having used the plural right um term for a single person probably two or three people aren't wearing that backpack. It's probably just one person. I mean, that would be the realistic expectation. Um, same with if you leave the room and I didn't get a look at you to make an assumption about your gender, I might be like, oh, did anybody see that person? I wonder if they're gonna come back. You know, where did they go, right? And we do it automatically without thinking about it. Even when we argue, that we have no use for they, them pronouns because you're talking about one person. So I don't care what someone says about their per, their pronouns, I'm not gonna call them they, them. Even in that sentence, we used them when talking about that person. The challenge that we have in society and we, we pretend in our brains, it's our way our brain protects us from thinking about things that cause us discomfort, right? Like when we have core beliefs, it's uncomfortable to look at those core beliefs in an objective way because they've informed our decisions forever. It's our our brain's way of making us able to think really fast and, and do all the things we need to do in the world. So we hold those beliefs, even when we, we're trying to be open-minded. Um, but the they, them as a singular is like the brain's trick to stop us from looking at it. It's a way to protect those core values. And that's okay. Right, like that doesn't make you a bad person that that's what you go to. And we can also go, oh, like, where's that coming from? And instead look at how we need to know what someone's gender is when we interact with them. Why is that? Right, that one of the first things we do when we look at someone is go, okay, well, they've got long hair, they're wearing makeup, they're curvy, must be a girl, right? You know, like we, Go ahead, Ace. Sorry. Um, okay. I think the reason why that is is because people are have a a binary decision when it comes to their sexuality. Okay. Because I never imagined myself having lovers who had penises. Okay. But when I started being attracted to men who were so feminine that I was turned on. I didn't care that that was the situation. So I'm not attracted to a gender. My I'm femme sexual. I'm attracted to femininity. I am not attracted whatsoever to masculinity in a man or a woman or non-binary person. 
but I took a long time to figure that out. So we want to know, are you my sexual preference? Then you rule that out and go to friendship. Because when you meet somebody, you think it's sexual attraction, it could be admiration, it could be emotional attraction, mental attraction, physical attraction. You don't know, but automatically we go to sexual and we want to know. So we're interested in that person, but we have to open our mind, you know, because I, my preference is women. And then I started to be discovered some women have penises. But then on top of that, I met women who were, who did have penises, but were masculine. And that was the turn off for me, not the genitalia. So it took me 61 years to get here. It's going to take people a long time to challenge their sexual preferences. Because 99% of your lovers could be, let's say, male, and one's a female. And that might blow your mind. Why? You were compatible. You were compatible. And on the other end of that, like, yes, for some people, absolutely. It's about, are you someone I can put in my dating field, right? Yeah. Can I be attracted to you without feeling yeah. bad about myself? And yeah. um, taking in that, that, you know, homophobia that, that no matter how queer we are, we still carry society's gift of homophobia. So we have to do that work quite often to unpack that. Well, even a lot of drag queens have to get out of drag in order to be attractive to a, for a man to be attracted to them. Not always, but I hear that their femininity expression is limited if they want the, the boyfriend, husband or whatever, and vice versa. We, we Lesbians don't mind uh, a trans man if he hasn't had bottom surgery, but as I discovered, when I decided to go for bottom surgery, I lost my lover. So, there, there's discrimination. It messes with everybody's mind. Cis, it really trans, does. Great, gay. <laughs> and it's, and I'm part of like the elol community. Um, you know the, and they've changed their name now, which I'm very grateful for. And that's a conversation that comes up all the time. It's like I'm a lesbian, so I'm attracted to women. And for me, that means this is a no penis zone. And it's like, well, then you need to say that you're attracted to vulvas, right? Like we, we need to differentiate between that because gender and sex are different, which is um, if, if, if that fits, we'll end up doing that activity of separating those two things out. Like what we're attracted to doesn't necessarily just mean genitals and it doesn't necessarily mean just gender because gender's in our head. It's our perception of ourselves and other people. So yes, to sexual, sexual attraction. Beyond femininity which is another mind screw for me. Could, could I live with a man? Could I have sex with a man since I'm married and we're polyamorous to have sex with a man who is masculine? And I, I there, I found out, I found out, yeah, I can. So that was before we got married, but anyhow. And that's, I mean, self-growth is amazing, right? But the other aspect of needing to know what someone's gender is is we need to know how to treat them in other ways. We use different language when we're talking to someone we perceive as a woman as compared to someone we perceive as a man. We are more likely to go to someone that we assume is female to talk about emotional issues, relationship problems, child rearing issues, and to diminish them when it comes to academic progress. And, and this will vary from person to person. So I'm, I'm talking in like absolutes, but like this is a really smushy area where every person has done their own degree of work on this, right? So I think that our younger generations, like from what I've witnessed at the center and from doing research and in my academic studies, our younger generations are not ascribing to gender, period. And a lot of them aren't using they, them pronouns anymore they're saying their gender is eh. and when they're like i don't care what pronouns you use they actually mean it like they're not doing it to be lazy and discount that for some people pronouns matter they're saying gender is whatever you want to make of it like they've got this whole new view and the changes have happened so quickly that in my lifetime we went from thinking trans people were like this this real outlier that rarely existed, like maybe one in a million people to having these conversations in kindergarten and understanding we need to support kids immediately when they start expressing their own gender identity. And 
it has changed everything academically, like the way we do our research. It's, you know, so pronouns have become a really big deal. Um, so that's my big talk about, you know, gender and pronouns and why we resist using they, them. Because when you say they, them, and you look at someone like me, right? I have a feminine voice. I have breasts that stick out. Um, I don't have the, the square face. I couldn't pull off androgyny if somebody sent me to a makeover place. I'm just not built that way, okay? But I don't owe you androgyny in order to be gender non-binary because gender is a perception of our own traits and our relationship with those roles that come with it. Does that kind of make sense? Does anybody have, like, I, I see a few hands going. I have an issue with that myself. Okay. If you're going to say be, if you're going to be non-binary and you do not want gender to progress into the future as an issue one way or the other, then do not look one way or the other. Because <laughs> that's like saying that, okay, you're holding a gun and you're at a peace rally. It doesn't make sense. So for my idea of women's liberation, anti-war movements, everything, the gay pride parades, whatever we've been through, I'm not saying it's a representation that everybody has to look non-binary. Like even our parades were, were not appropriate. They were not racially mixed. They, they always, the young, well, gorgeous, able-bodied gay man was the focus of the whole show and tell parade to entertain cisgendered people. And we thought we were being liberated, but half the times we were being laughed at. So yeah, I have an issue with not looking the non-binary. I am, I am going to address that. Does anybody <laughs> else have anything to add? Larry? I, I would add maybe two things that are, are very obvious, uh, but I didn't support what you say. Firstly, you, in the second person is a plural pronoun. We haven't said thou, which is the singular for a very long time indeed. And the second point I would make is that in the issue of sexual orientation, we have accepted the notion of a continuum and a diversity for a very long time. I'm not sure why we've had such difficulty in accepting it when it comes to uh, gender identity. And thirdly, I guess, in following your argument, I'm wondering whether it might be helpful to keep the questions to uh, uh, once you've made your points. I, I don't know that's your choice. Okay. It helps, it helps me a little bit. But what I would like to do is I'd like to share my screen, and I'm going to show you a genderbred person. And I think some folk have probably already seen this already. Are you able to see my genderbred guy? Yeah. Yeah. So we always call them genderbred men, right? Like that's always what it's called. So this one is a gender person. And when we're, it represents what we are as humans. So if you take a look where it says sex, right? It's using the, you know, male, female, and intersex symbol. Um, and that's our sex, right? That's our, our biological sex in a science word so that's our secondary sex characteristics um like growing breasts and body hair and, and all of that kind of thing it's about our genitals that we're born with at birth our reproductive organs right our chromosomes our hormones and all of that that stuff um, and we know from all the things that are being done in the world that this stuff is changeable Right. If somebody born with a vulva goes on testosterone, they actually grow their clitoris into a what the doctors call a dicklet. Like it, it will actually increase in size and meet the expectations for the length of what they would consider a penis when they're looking um, at people and deciding if they're, you know, male, female or intersex. And so we know those things change. We know we can change body hair. We know we can change our breasts. We know we can do phalloplasty and, you know, we can have these surgeries done and go on hormone treatments. And, you know, so we know that physical sex, anatomical sex is something that we can, if we choose to change and control, but that is our sex. So we're talking just about those physical characteristics the one thing sex is not 
is gender. Okay, mm -hmm. so go to the other side of the body and we look at the brain and that's our gender identity. All right, so our gender identity is kind of like what we think about ourselves. what's in our head, who do we know ourselves to be based on how much we align or don't align with our own concepts of what gender is. And that can include gender roles, gender traits, even gender expression might be part of our view of what gender is. As I mean, it, Ace made that clear that expression for Ace is part of that view of your, your gender identity. And that's totally cool because it's personal and subjective. It's our own ideas of are we masculine are we feminine or are we somewhere in the middle that's our gender identity you can't see that on the outside because that's happening in someone's head right and then our gender expression is the stuff that's visible so for me i'll just take my headset off for a second but like i show it a little bit you know i do the and i often chop my hair off i might and then i just look like a Justin Bieber before he hit puberty with short hair. So I didn't particularly enjoy that. Um, so I grew it back out. Um, I express it by um, how I choose my clothing. I mean, I don't wear makeup. I, I'm not into doing the fancy nails or having all the jewelry. And that's gender expression. And people do that differently. So you will see some people who are non-binary or gender queer, two-spirited, dressing in a way where you look at them and you can't quite, like, am I talking to a, a boy? Am I talking to a girl? You don't know. And some people don't express their gender that way. And that's okay, because it's a choice. And I know really masculine people who express their gender um, as more feminine, but they view themselves as masculine. and and you know, the reverse is also true. And that's okay, because that's expression. We can express our gender however we want to, but it is going to be interpreted by other people's ideas of gender norm, right? So I can't stop people from looking at me, seeing my boobs and going, oh, that's a girl, unless I wear a binder and I'm asthmatic, so I found that problematic, or get my breasts removed. Right? Like they're going to look at that and see that. I see Ace is dying over there. I only have one more, one more section, and then I will come to that. Um, attraction is what we're attracted to. And that can be romantic, it can be um, physical or somewhere else. And this is a lot like, sorry, I can't remember. I think that was Larry was saying that. Like we've learned that this is a continuum it, that. You know, it's, am I attracted to people who are masculine or feminine? Am I attracted to penises or, or vulvas or somewhere in the both? Or am I romantically attracted to people who are feminine, but sexually attracted to people that are masculine? And does that change? Like, these are all part of our attraction. And that has nothing to do with our anatomical sex, our gender identity, or how we express it. Although we can signal to people in certain age groups, at least, who we're attracted to by how we dress, right? Or how we behave. Um, for the younger generations, that doesn't work as well because they're not expressing their gender in the same way that my generation was, or you know, the generations ahead of me, or even the generation right underneath me. So this is all social context and changes over time. So this is, I invite you to think about this for yourself and I will make sure that this little handout goes to you um, to just really think about like, what did this look like when you were 14? What did it look like when you were 40? What does it look like now? And all of that, like the identity, the attraction, how you express it, and you know, even the anatomical sex and your understanding of it, because it can really help when we're dealing with gender variations. I'm just gonna stop sharing. And I appreciate that you held on to that, Ace. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to hog the situation. It's just that as a transgender man, I've come across a lot of situations that I, I will have to say, and some people might be getting upset here, but I worked as a bouncer at Buddies, and I, I was able to talk a lot of people down from fighting. 
and I got along with with everybody who worked at the bar and the drag queens and all that stuff. And I think for 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 me, one gay man came up to me and he said, "You know, I love you, Ace. I think you're handsome, gorgeous. You know, you've even been to the bathhouse a couple of times or whatever. You know, you're you're great. You know." However, you have to have this understanding in your mind. You will never be a man. You're a dyke who took her arm to create a permanent strap on. No gay man will want to have sex with you unless you wear jock and bottom and shut up. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a leather man. Okay. I earned my leather with the bikers as a chick. That's tough enough. I don't have to go through this, this boy to master kind of thing, okay? I'm respected. Even Sir Scott respects me and a lot of other people in the community. However, people have an issue and it's not safe sometimes, okay? I I got beaten up once outside of work where I worked at a plastic factory. Okay. I'm going to ask you to hold this because I I'll think be I think I'll you and really I could spend an hour talking about this. No, no, this. no. I'll be really quick. I'll get you, I'll get to the point. My generation, it's dangerous for me to be effeminate. Okay, I want to wear eyeliner, black nail polish, earrings, tons of jewelry. I don't care if people identify me as a gay man because I'm bisexual. I admire gay men. But I'm going to get the crap kicked out of me in my generation. The non-binary people think I've sold out. I have it. I'm in fear. I cannot do get away with that at 60 that you can do at 20. And they separate themselves from me because I'm a binary sellout. Sorry, I'll be now. So, and I think this brings up a really important point that I was trying to make with like earlier, where we have to recognize that other people are going to interpret our gender. And one of the ways I signal to people that I won't tolerate being treated in that girl box is by flagging my pronouns, right? For lack of a better word, I flag them. And um, it starts a conversation. And I had a lot of people who do the same thing, but in the reverse that, that Ace is talking about, where they tell me I'm not queer enough because although I'm um, pansexual and I have had romantic and sexual relationships of people across the gender spectrum, um, my my life partner who I've been with for 10 years is mask presenting and therefore they put me in the heterosexual box it doesn't matter what I do I'm in the heterosexual box and the same with gender right so they're like you're not non-binary because you're not rocking the non-binary look like I mean what am I supposed to do with this to rock a non-binary look and I mean same with my hips right and I'm 50 so I can go on hormones how long is it going to take before things change. And because I've gone through second puberty, I'm already doing menopause. A lot of those things aren't going to change. And I honestly, I don't hate my body. So why? It's not the body that I have an issue with, it's gender. So it's not sex that doesn't fit for me, right? I didn't I'm, need to offend. No, when I'm I not offended. I think it's a good conversation. I'm honestly not offended. Okay, I think, I, and this is important, like to recognize. So when we're looking at the different generations, recognizing that homophobia and gender binaries were way more rigid. And so we can look at our youth and have understanding for where they're at and deal with the fact that, I mean, I'm jealous. I am really jealous and it hurts me that my age group isn't as accepting that they're not as able to have compassion for people who aren't doing things the same way as they did. Yes. And I mean, and I, I've done a lot of fighting for women's rights and um, it hurts when people look at that and they're like, well, and now you're non-binary, but you're not. So you're, do you know what I mean? So I get this. And this is a really important takeaway for any gender discussion as to recognize that, that we're talking about how we feel in our own heads and the way we express it and that expression comes for a lot of reasons right i am too lazy to change the way that i look to please someone else's idea of what they them should look like i just don't care if when people meet me they instantly know i'm part of the non-binary queer community i don't care 
the people I care about are like, you folk, we're having a conversation about it. Now you know a little bit about me. I've been vulnerable. You can respect it and we'll be friends or not. Right? Like I'm at that age where I don't, I don't need to do that. And I have enough community around me where I'm safe to do that. So I, I mean, and so much respect for the generations that came before and did the fighting. Like, I don't want you to think that, that you know, I'm, I'm going, hey, this is how you have to do gender. I'm telling you why pronouns have become such a big part of the, the cultural conversation that's going on, particularly around um, gender and how it's separate from sex and the context of the generation a person is in is really going to influence both their ideas of gender, their ideas of sex, their ideas of attraction and how they're physically expressing it. Does that kind of help folks? Awesome. And somebody was asking about, um, we talked about Zezer as neo pronouns and what new words I think will happen. Um, I chose deliberately to use they, them. And sometimes if I'm going into situations where I'm not sure people understand queerness, I'll go they, she. It's my way of being safe, right? I need to, and to make it safe for them too. Because if I smack people upside the head with faith, fam, or zzer or any of these neo pronouns, um, it's, it's a barrier that happens. Right. So if I'm like, hey, you know, I'm feminine presenting, I call myself Femby for a reason. I'm feminine presenting, but all of this in here is like completely discarding these gender ideas and traits and stereotypes that were assigned in society. I don't believe in them. You know, um, like I, I crochet and I woodwork, right? I can change the oil in my car and I can, you know, make cinnamon buns. Like, why can't I do both of those things? Like this is, you know, I'm terrible at math because I'm dyslexic, but I'm very analytical and I love collecting trivia about pretty much everything. Like, why can't I have both of those things at the same time? Why is one of those unusual because I have breasts and the other not? So like, that's my experience. And I can signal that with they. But if I, if I say to you, hey, I'm Fei Fem or I'm Z Zer, then immediately there's this barrier where people are like, I don't want to deal with that. That's, that's new age crap. They had no room for it. Day's hard enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like everybody has to choose for themselves how much they want to battle day to day. Right? Somebody who's choosing to appear non-binary, they know that every time they go to a public restroom, they're going to be dealing with somebody, right? They know that their family is going to, you know, be on different sides of supporting or non-supporting. And they know they have to do that work, right? So if you're assigned female at birth, that means filling in your eyebrows. If you're assigned male at birth, that means like, you know, like there's all this stuff that comes into presenting our, our gender. And so we need to respect that, People are gonna choose pronouns that validate them inside and that they feel safe using. And that's okay. And what we can do is when someone says, hey, my pronouns are Z, Zer, we can even say, so is Z for like the replacement for, for he, she, and Zer for they, them? So that I know how to, you know, how to use this, um, you know, and or hers, his, like, how do I, we can do that and, just deal with it, right? Or we can be like, I'm not using those because I'm close-minded and I've decided that only he, him, and she, her are valid pronouns. Does that kind of make sense? So it's just like the battle for sexuality to be appreciated. Um, what I got here, two-spirited. I don't know very much about two-spirit. I've been doing a lot of um, research lately and taking classes on indigenous culture. But I don't know if you noticed, I'm really, really white. And so I was raised to be a colonizer and I'm doing all the work now to decolonize my thinking and language, but I'm pretty sure this will be a lifelong journey. What I really do admire about what I have learned about Two-Spirited is that they do recognize, like it's, it's kind of how I feel about life, right? They recognize that every human being carries both masculine and feminine traits. And for people who are Two-Spirited, they embody that fully. And that's amazing that, that, well, and very sad that, you know, as European background that I come from, that we managed to tamper, 
tamp that down into the ground and not respect it. But it aligns with the way I look at gender, where it's like everybody has traits, right? And they're not because of your genitals. Um, does anybody else find it really funny now? Like when we've had so many conversations around genitals that when somebody is expecting, the first thing people ask is, you know, oh, is your baby got a penis or a vulva? And they're shocked if you say, well, why do you want to know their genitals? Do you know what I mean? Because it's still, is it a boy or a girl? Is that just me? It's just me. Okay. That was my little humor. It's, it's not just you. I was born into it. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of dykey lesbian women my age did get affected by the drug that was used other than thalidomide. And it did make us intersex. We were downsized, put F on our birth certificate, and sent off. And I always knew I was a boy. But the thing is, this is more common than you know in the lesbian generation, my generation. And that's why there was so much masculinity at that time. It wasn't just women's liberation. Obviously, if someone's liberated, they can crochet and watch a football game, like I do. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, intersex even now with births today is as common as redheads. Eric? Just, uh, I guess, a generational divide. Um, I think I'm 74, so I've been around here for an awful long time, and I grew up in a time of very, very strict gender roles. And even if you were gay, it was a very strict pigeonhole that you were being placed in. And so I'm wondering, and this is trying to be, I don't know, but if there can be some education for younger people about, I, I mean, and because I do, I've been involved some with some projects with youth and that sort of thing. So I know what the definition of cisgender is. <laughs> Two years ago, I remember talking to a friend and talking about, you know, a, a cisgender man or a woman, and they had no idea what I was talking about because I'm operating in more of a social work area that it I'm familiar with it but other people of my age who are you know living the standard life just never never exposed to that type of thing and I'm wondering if some education can be going the other way to say listen some of the older folks may not be aware of these because they grew up they're so used to growing up in a time of such strict roles Absolutely. And ASPEC does that. So for all of our youth sex ed programs, um, when we talk about gender, we don't normally have to teach the gender bread because the youth, they're learning this in school. So a lot of what we talk about is like gender norms and what it means for someone my age, what I've seen in my lifetime and what I've learned from the generations ahead of me and historically where these roles came from and how restrictive they are in society. We do a lot of that compassion building that you're talking about. And I think that's, that's a big part of the reason why we see so much, I don't wanna say so much because like a lot, of, a lot of us are able to have healthy relationships with our elders and with the younger generations, but there is more intergenerational conflict, particularly in the queer community. Um, because there's this, this notion that the other generation doesn't get what their generation gets and we see that on all sides and yet um what i've noticed is that the youth they do want to learn what the elders had to go through and they love those stories and they they take away a lot from it um, but i do get a lot more resistance from the older generations and i think that has to do with being exhausted right like we've already done all the fighting we just want our our trophy you know what I mean? And for them to respect that and they can do the work. Um, but like, so there's this, this back and forth and it's the same thing with gender. Like, I think you've really hit it on the nose there is that we need to make sure that we are sharing our stories and our struggles and not in a way that's like, listen here, youngster, like you have no idea, but instead going, I really value you being vulnerable. Can I be vulnerable and share my experience? We need to learn the language that the youth are using so that we can have those conversations in a way that's mutually beneficial. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
dry throat from talking. I really appreciate that you brought that up, Eric. Thank you. Um, I don't remember how much time I have. I would love to come back and do the dating piece because I think that's a huge long piece for um, seniors if that's something y'all are interested in. Um, but in the meantime, I can tell you that you're allowed to have boundaries, which is something new, right? Like even when I started dating as a teenager, you boundaries weren't something that was acceptable. So when you talk about protecting your assets, um, you're absolutely allowed, completely allowed to be like, I'm interested in dating, but like this is all you get to interact with below the waist, not, or, you know, I'm, I have to get to know you and we've got to be really good friends. And even then sex might not be on the table. That is completely acceptable in a way that it was not acceptable when I was growing up. And I know for the older generations, even less so, right. There is a lot of pressure. And um, yeah, consent is a really big deal these days and ties into pronouns quite nicely because people deserve to be treated in the way that they set their boundaries to be treated, right? And if that means calling someone fey femme, then that's what we do. It costs us nothing, even if we don't like it and don't agree with it. Any last minute questions? I can see the clock ticking down. I, I would just like to say, I, I do respect the they, them. I will use they, them. I will, I understand the gender revolution just as much as I understand the anti-war or the women's revolution or everything that's going on and it's needed. And I like the fact that the younger group is doing it. However, when they meet me, the assumption is I'm a binary boomer, toxic, masculine, old fart, and I have no skin in the game. And I find that the things that I sacrifice, I disagree with war, but I remember Remembrance Day because I don't have those freedoms that my uncle died for. Like, I won't have those freedoms. They have what they have today. And I'm talking about this as a transgender kind of thing, not the bigger gay community. They are learning about the transgender, but within the transgender community, I my opinion is irrelevant to the younger group. And they've made that very clear to me when I tried to try to start a trans master. So you and I need to talk if there's somewhere else that they give a crap because as far as I'm concerned, they told me they don't. Reach out to me, Ace. I would love to do a video interview with you to add to our, our things and same with anybody else that would like to share the stories of the journey that they've been through um, with the Youth Compassion Projects because I think that's really important. Um, and I'm sorry, but it seems to me like you're running afoul of the younger leather community, which isn't really representative of the larger community. What do you mean I'm running the fall? It, when you hit people that are like, I won't respect that because you didn't, because you're old, you're a boomer, you're mass presenting and that kind of stuff that seems to be like a, a um, I call them leather wannabes, like it's the younger leather community, that say, like the younger queer community that tends to gatekeep a lot. I know the I folks that reach the out. Leather, the, the leather bit, because I am a leather person, but I go by the old guard rules, even though as a dyke, I wasn't allowed to be in the old guard. They Go ahead, Larry. Privately. I know we could get totally sidetracked. Oh, yeah, 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 I got to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting upset. Lots of love. Go ahead, Larry. Contact, contact me if you want. Uh, um, so I think um, uh, one of the other uh, issues that, has, <clears throat> excuse me, that has just been brought up is um, the, the whole um, concerned about ageism um, and how that is another uh, kind of um, ism that that I think is uh, uh, um, is pretty predominant kind of thing out uh, kind of throughout society and and, and certainly if I think of, of myself you know um, when, when I was 15 I'm etc et I'm sure I was much the same at that at that time as well um, and that is an issue uh, that is an area that they, it, it, groups like sage and others have been working really hard to try to change that notion um, uh, and try to get people to to not think about um, how 
what your actual number is in terms of age has been the significant kind of uh, uh, area. But but we get caught in it. Um, uh, it. Society gets caught in it. You know, when you're older, you cost more health care and blah, 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 and on and on it goes kind of thing in that. So um, it, it, it's a um, probably a, another, if we talk about intersection, intersectionality, that's it's one of those other kind of areas. So that's I just wanted to mention huge. that. Thanks. Absolutely. So the older generation quite often discounts the younger generation yep. and vice versa. Yeah. It, it happens. And um, all we can do is make sure that we're guarding ourselves against doing that and making room for validating and respecting that everybody's experiences are real and valid and important. I see Michael also has something to say. Oh, that is you. I was going to... Uh, ask Angel whether you would agree with me that our understanding of gender is evolving and things will change. And I think we shouldn't get in too rigid or dog dogmatic boxes. I mean, my bias is in is, is a risk of underestimating the importance of biology in all of this. It, it, you know, we're still, I think, coming to understand the complexities Absolutely. And I think um, we're, we're also going to discover that intersex happens more often than we think yeah. and can be responsible for a lot of um, the angst over gender binaryism. And then on top of that, as we get less rigid with these binary roles, it allows people to actually authentically look at their own selves and see their own relationships without that stigma from society. And I think once that stigma isn't the norm, like, you know, masculine um, presenting people with feminine traits and vice versa being, you know, like we have to quit calling boys sissies for crying and quit calling, you know, girls unladylike for having opinions and like so forth and so on. And that's happening. Yeah. So as that happens more, we're going to be able to see what the norms are in a more supportive society. And it'll be easier to study the biology. Um, it totally not on the exact same train, but we're seeing in the research on neurodiverse people, so folks with autism, ADD, ADHD, and that um, lack of dopamine that seems to be related to these disorders, that, um, and I like differability is better than disorders, but they're still calling it that, so here we are. Um, but there is a huge representation of gender non-binary, transgender, and um, asexuality and uh, fluid sexuality in those demographics. So how much of our hormones influences the way we think about things will be really interesting to see as research continues in those areas. But yeah, absolutely. Let's not be too rigid. These are subjective right? They're based on our social contacts and whatever the norms are in society and our own experiences. So they're going to fl be fluid and change. One of the Other things that I've picked up from your conversation today is um, what I, the benefit of intergenerational contact, of intergenerational understanding. And I think that that really helps everybody as i say i've been fortunate enough to you know be in contact with younger folks who have been able to tell me about their idea of sexual or gender expression and, and so on and i've been able to say well yeah i i understand that but you have to understand that a lot of people my age grew up with such rigid definitions that it's very hard for them to change so uh you Aspec is doing some intergenerational work. Um, we are. We started what we call the Compassion Project, mm -hmm. where we're interviewing people and getting those stories. We're including them in the work. Um, right now, we're targeting youth because we think that the youth are more likely to be flexible enough to start changing. Whereas I find even now, I mean, I, I just hit 50 and I have a harder time switching gears than I did 10 years ago. So we're starting with youth, but yeah, that's something I'd love to talk to you folk about for sure. Yeah. Good so stuff. share my email, reach out. Let's, let's do some collaborating. Okay. We've got four minutes left. Does anybody else have any other final questions or comments? 
If not, give me an opportunity to do two things. First is to plug next week's session, which is uh, going to be just as interesting as today, I'm sure, uh, which will be Janice Irwin and Laurie Sigurdsson, two NDP members. Um, Janice is part of the ML, ML Gay uh, Caucus, and uh, Laurie is certainly very, very supportive of our community and extremely interested in issues surrounding, surrounding seniors. Um, so stay tuned for that. The next and the most important part, Angel, thank you so much for today. This was a really interesting and fun uh, discussion. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Oh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm really hard to offend. And I'm sorry, Jan, that the conversation got riled up and we didn't get to talk more about dating. Uh, but like I said, I'm willing to come back and do that at, at your folks' convenience. You've said the magic words. You're willing to come back. <laughs> So your name will be on the list, Angel. Thank you. Um, any other, anybody else with any final comments or shall we say goodbye for today? That's it. I guess we'll say goodbye for today. Thanks again, Angel. Really appreciate it. It's lovely you. to meet you all. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Angel. Thanks. Thank you. It's nice to meet you all. <laughs>